Chalice from Environmental Coffee House today. And uh, actually, I've got this article that I found that I, I kind of like. Uh, it's different, but it gives you, it gives us this idea that maybe we can we can get things done on a local level. Uh, you know, I talk about that politically. That uh, trickle up is where it's at. I say that we we really need to um, look at in our own backyards. And Kelly's joined us. Hi, Kelly. Hi, thanks for joining. But it's a long one and I'm gonna get started because I thought that this was an awesome, um, sort of a pick me up, but I don't know if you could call it a pick me up or not. Um, but let's go for this because it's so easy. We talk about a lot of times, we talk about all the things that are horrible all over, fires, floods, droughts, all of this. This guy, Rob, uh, Roy Morrison, wrote this article called Climate Truth, Seven Key Numbers for Sustainability and Local Action. And he, he, um, it's, he writes for Global Research Canada. It's a, it's a, it's a, we use global research. We, we use this one. It, one could say in a way that this article kind of has a lot of hopium, but I'm going to go with this because I feel that it is never over until it's over and it ain't over yet. You know, no matter what we're seeing, we still live somewhere and we still have work to do. So let's get going on this one. He, he starts out, he says, um, local action on climate is both an essential and available path for ecological transformation. Local action does not require permission from Washington or from Paris. Action overcomes despair. Local action and planning for sustainability is essential to mitigate the consequences of emergency climate catastrophe and chart the path for a transition to a sustainable ecological civilization. Now, a lot of people would say that's bull. There's nothing sustainable. There's nothing that's going to work. There's nothing, 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 negative, negative. I, I can't do that, you know, because as long as I'm breathing, I, I can't do it. And that's why I kind of like this article. Plus, it's very interesting. He talks about seven simple numbers with global consequences can help guide local action and the pursuit of crucial ecological goals. They will serve as co-evolutionary force with global geophysical impact. Life on Earth has meant life's co-evolution with the biosphere. For instance, creating the oxygen atmosphere and maintaining just enough carbon dioxide to keep the planet not too hot, and not too cold. Coevolution is the strongest survival factor. It is sustainability in action, the driving force behind life's ability to withstand periodic mass extinctions and once again thrive. I don't know if we're going to make it or not. I. I'm not a prognosticator, but as Michael says here, nothing is impossible. Hey, Jennifer's joined us. Hi, Jennifer. How nice. Jennifer Hines, this is great. Okay, so he goes on to say that uh, self-conscious human activity has been able to pour enormous amounts of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, changing the climate. Now it is our time to self-consciously not only stop carbon dioxide pollution, but to remove and sequester carbon in land and ocean biomass and into soil, which is the big school of thinking on one side, you know, and on, 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 in science that's been researched. Our local responsibility with healing global consequence is to both slash greenhouse gas emissions and to remove carbon dioxide by soil building, tree planting, and a new global aquaculture producing enormous amounts of kelp and algae in the oceans to pull, pull many gigatons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Now is the time for humanity's self-conscious action to respond to and mitigate the consequences of pollution and habit destruction unleashed by industrial civilization. Mouthful, huh? The issue on the table is not to figure out how to uh, close, 
how close to catastrophe we can get without upsetting the polluters, but to make a 180 degree turn from catastrophe and work toward both slashing carbon dioxide emissions at least 80% or more by 2040. And at the same time, sequester many gigatons of carbon in soil and biomass through an exercise in global cooling. This will be policy and investment basis for turning from business and pollution as usual to building an ecological civilization. This person is very positive. You know, uh, a lot of the things I read says that they say that, oh, like the article, the thing we put up on our page with uh, the 1973 video that a computer in one of the uh, universities predicted that we would be extinct by 2040, exactly for the reasons that we're doing things now. Of course, none of us want to think that way. Of course not. So that's why this article gives us, it gives us something else to think about it, uh, you know, besides ourselves and our despair and our misery, it, it's, it talks about doing things for the betterment of where we are. Uh, an, econo an ecological civilization will be one that nurtures and maintains the balance of the ecosphere with the intention of persisting on geological time scales. Millions and millions of years, human actions needs to attempt to reduce atmospheric carbon and ocean acidity from dissolved carbon dioxide bec uh, become car oh, carbonic acid to pre-industrial levels. Maybe he's 20 to 30 years too late. I don't know. For this to happen, economic growth must mean ecological improvement and the regeneration of ecosystems and the biosphere and a global convergence upon sustainable and just norms for all. The context of this is the global adoption of efficient renewable resource to replace fossil and nuclear fuels, installation of an ecological productive infrastructure, ecological agriculture, forestry, aquaculture, and the pursuit of social and ecological justice that's a mouthful. And, you know, it just sounds utopian, uh, especially with the political situation in the United States, you know, Whoop. the United States. Okay. So this is an aggressive, a very aggressive economic growth and investment strategy that benefits everyone that makes ecological conduct social and ecological justice, the basis for new ecological market rules, and an ecological definition of fiduciary responsibility. This is a plan to end global poverty, replace a war system with a peace system. This is based on the common pursuit of self-interest and building an ecological global civilization that will be richer, greener, more peaceful, fairer, healthier, and sustainable. <sighs> It's, it's uh, a dream. <laughs> Renewable resources already are already replacing fossil fuels at an astounding and accelerating pace. Fossil fuels in the ground, as well as both fossil fuel and nuclear plants are rapidly becoming stranded assets. Even Saudi Arabia is working to building a renewable economy. The issues we need to address are the nature of new market rules to accelerate this process and to support the distributed and fair ownership of assets in the efficient, renewable, and zero pollution, zero waste future that I will discuss in further detail in future articles. All right, so this guy is setting out something. There's nothing wrong with doing that. There's nothing wrong in setting out solutions, even when there are so many saying that there are no solutions, that there's we can't go forward. We're going to be extinct. It doesn't matter. We're not. So we need to do what we can do. That's how I feel, you know, upward and onward. And I know what's going on. I, I know how awful it is. I don't think we're going to have a blue ocean event this year. That is something I read on Torstein Vidal's blog. Um, uh, any of the Arctic people are not calling for that. So it just gives us, what, a little more time to maybe try to do something through political change and listen to someone like this guy. I'll say hello to a couple of people. 
Michael says, right now this country is run by the devil. It's run by some icky people. Hi, sweetie. Hi, Carol. So nice to have you guys here because I totally didn't plan this, but I did read this and yesterday and I've wanted to do this, but I have a very busy household because uh, we're having a party. Um, all right, so the bottom line is that the reduction of carbon dioxide to a sustainable three tons per person per year level combined with three tons of sequestration per person per year and rising is a recipe for an ecological global growth system that restores ecosystems, slashes pollution, depletion, and ecological damage, and is predicated on the common pursuit of social and ecological justice, which I believe has to be the cornerstone of every single, every political candidate because yeah, we want single payer. We want all the good things in the United States. We want what other countries have for their people. We, we do. But if we do not change this uber capitalistic society to be an ecologically thinking society, we'll never get to where this guy is talking about. So he talks about that and then he goes, um, it means a much greener, much richer, much more peaceful world within the context of ecological economic growth and restoration of ecosystems and the pursuit of social and ecological justice. The conversion of market and planning must be towards ecological and just ends. Can you imagine the entire globe, instead of focusing on fossil fuels and producing plastic shit and all of this very uh, surface stuff, everyone commits to zero population growth and doing what he says, you know, all of this, um, getting rid of changing our everything about us he says it's an enormous job in the aggregate but we just have to focus on the here and now and a rather se a simple series of steps seven simple numbers can help guide our path forward so number one he talks 21 gigatons of carbon dioxide emissions a year. 21 gigatons a year. That's 21 billion metric tons. That's roughly the amount of carbon dioxide that the biosphere can handle and maintain the concentration of carbon relatively consistent and keep our climate in the gridlock zone, just right for the ecosphere, ecosphere for humanity and for agriculture, fishing and aquaculture that supports the 7.2 billion and rising population. Carbon dioxide is both the most significant and long-lasting global greenhouse gas. Methane, nitrogen oxides, refrigeration, chloral, fluorocarbon, CFCs also must be considered and included in our emission reduction planning and actions. But for now, we will focus on the carbon dioxide. 21 gigatons is a dynamic number reflecting responses to changing conditions of the ecosphere. Historically, Events such as mass volcanic eruptions in the Eocene some 50 million years ago led to spiking of glo uh, global carbon dioxide levels and global temperatures soaring in the Eocene thermal maximum. As the ice melted, ocean levels were 70 feet higher. Isn't this what we see happening? Not that high now. Um, and the Arctic and the Arctic and Antarctic were tropical. This persisted until some hundreds of thousands of years later. Now I'm gonna go through this. Um, he says, the lesson is that the planet is likely to do just fine eventually without a mega polluting industrial civilization, which means us. Now I contend that there are a lot of people that think that the humanity, humanity is a cancer and should be eradicated and left to go extinct. You know, that's, that, that's, that's a lot of people I read because what we do to the planet is, is hideous and unforgivable. It really is. But then on the other side, there are a lot of beautiful people and there are, I mean, we wouldn't have gotten to, to some of the, to the milestones that we've reached as a species without people that have a heart, without people that see the goodness, without people that are not driven by just mere greed. Number two, he says three tons of carbon dioxide equivalents per person per year. This is a really long article. So I'm just going to pick out a couple of things 
Um, he says, unfortunately, for big polluters like the U.S., the average carbon dioxide output per person is almost 17 tons of carbon dioxide per person per year. Now, that is far above the global average of, um, let's see, the global average, I lost myself, <laughs> of so 7.5 tons of carbon per person per year. In a, in a poor country like Mali, carbon dioxide emissions per person per year are only, wow, 1.1 ton, Italy 5.3 tons and falling, India 1.7 tons and rising. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. China 7.5 tons and rising, Australia 15.4 tons, slightly rising. The reason why is because countries want to be uh, modernized. They think that by modernizing that they will be happier, but modernizing comes from the use of fossil fuels and the renewed use of coal in the United States. I read an article today about in Atlantic about uh, the coal miners in Alabama and they are going to be selling to China. So uh, Karen says, that's because we keep buying stuff. Yeah, we are spoiled. I am spoiled, like getting ready for a party. Oh my God, it was insane just shopping for all the stuff. I bought everything I could. I spent a lot more, but everything is compostable, industrially compostable, or it's all plant-based made, the cups, every, everything, everything. And everybody gets one cup and puts their name on it. I wish all of you could come to this party because it's the last one I'm ever giving. <laughs> I'm never doing this again. I have been in such pain, guys, from um, lifting and doing, you know, I'm healing from neck surgery. It's nine weeks and I can't stop myself because there's a lot to do. <sighs> it is what it is. So he starts talking about how to get to this three ton thing in the United States. We have to reduce 14 tons of carbon dioxide per person per year, which is a big challenge because of the way we live. But if we had a mindset to just do it, just politically, if we had the political will to, to, to teach children in schools and just change our whole way of thinking in this country, it would definitely go to a lot of the other countries. But we are so messed up. I mean, so messed up politically. It's so hard to see what this article is saying it's hard to see it in action because of how messed up we are politically. I mean, we can't even, in the United States, we can't even verify our elections properly. We can't even know that they're, they're not hacked. So we'll still be controlled by an elite oligarchy that really is pulling the strings and is going to drill and do every last drop they can until we just don't have anything left in the ground. So he goes on and he talks about that, um, how much oil and gas is burnt releasing 50 billion tons of carbon dioxide pollution. And I will put the link up, I promise. And he talks about the, uh, you know, uh, how the, the replacing all fossil fuel and nuclear electric generation and expand use of much more efficient electric power to our cars and trucks, our factories, our heating and cooling to at least, uh, you know, eliminate the fossil fuel combustion. And I have something to say about that because always on the other side of that is, well, geez, you know, it takes mining and destruction and to make lithium batteries and to make uh, solar panels and to make wind generation and all of that is taking fossil fuels to get there. Well, how do we get there? I mean, really, if we, we use as, like he's saying, as little carbon as possible to get to the clean energy we need, utopia, right? then we're going to have to use some until we get there. And I don't know where there is. I don't know if there is human innovation because humans always come up with more or they work to a solution. Scientists never give up as long as they're not on the fossil fuel industry dole. <laughs> I talked about that the other day. Um, I always have to get something in on that one, I, I tell you. So he was talking about where he lives and, and um, 
getting to sustainable emissions, about three tons of carbon dioxide per person per year in your community, we all need to understand where we are now and make plans to where we want to take advantage of all available technological, legal, financial tools at hand. And I want to believe that this could be implemented in cities also, that it's not just because we are... Um, uh, you know, a, a middle class revolution. This has to be a revolution for all of everyone. Trickle up. So he does go on and he says, number four, 54 gigatons of carbon dioxide emissions per year globally. So he talks about the global uh, carbon dioxide emissions were 54 gigatons. He says it's in excess of 33 gigatons of carbon per year above a sustainable 21 gigaton. So think about it. You know, you look outside and you say, oh, it's a nice day, except if you're in California and you're looking at all the fire, um, the smoke and other places. But generally you look out, you might, oh, it's a nice day. You can't see all this stuff, but we're sure feeling all the effects of it, aren't we? Cancers, leukemias, all those things. Of course we are. Um, so he goes on and he talks about what happens in the next 20 years is crucial for the future of civilization. And there is typically a lag in how quickly climate change consequences manifest. It takes time, for example, for ice to melt and for global currents to alter as ocean salinity changes, which can substantially slow the Gulf Stream with dramatic effects on climate in Europe and the United States. I think we're seeing some of this now. But once changes on geophysical scale become manifest, chaotic dyna dynamics rule as the ecosphere finds new semi-stable equilibrium that will almost certainly be far less favorable for uh, existing human activities, most crucially agriculture. So, um, oh, hi, June. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'm doing all right. I'm always sore. <laughs> you know, it's, I, I, I I'm thanking you all for being with me. I'm trying not to bore you with this stuff. It's just, to me, it's fascinating because what this is saying here is that it's a plan. And no matter how screwed up everything is, having a plan and having something to work towards, like progressives are working, they have their plan for um, the um, single payer. We, in this ecosphere, ecological, environmental, mind frame, scientists, all of them, everyone has a plan. But we are so busy having to clean up the messes we're living through now, it does kind of take away from the positive nature of having a plan. I'm gonna jump down to um, number six, sequester three tons of carbon dioxide per person in soil and biomass. And he talks about how eliminating that 33 extra gigatons a year is, is not the only real number that our actions are measured in. He says, we simply have run out of time to reduce emissions with global carbon dioxide level increase. What we can do while we reduce emissions and the rate of increase in carbon dioxide is at the same time to remove it from the atmosphere and sequester it in soil and biomass. And he says it's a twofold job. And I'm not going to read it all because I want you to read the article. but. As I've been reading this, you know, that that it, that always that sense of we can do something for how long it, it 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 we have. And then maybe, who knows? Maybe species extinction can slow down. But it's such a huge political shift. We have such a fight against this fascist stuff, this fascist takeover that seems to be happening, but I don't want to go there. I want to go to number seven. And he has an eight, he has eight four-year plans for global ecological transformation 2018 to 2040. It's a business plan for our future. Starting with local town, city, or neighborhood carbon inventory, we can start to make comprehensive plans for reducing carbon emissions to the three tons of carbon per person and declining through an efficient renewable energy transformation, removing atmospheric carbon and sequestering in soil and biomass at rates of three tons per person, mitigation plans for climate change consequences and ecological economic development to make the productive investments for renewable energy transformation and for industry, agriculture, forestry that will make economic growth mean ecological improvement. 
And these should be conducted on the basis of goal setting and back planning from reaching ultimate goals and concrete steps, technically, physically, financially, regulatory, and educationally needed to go to get from here to there. He's in Canada. We're in the United States. Both countries need to radically change. Ontario just voted in a super right-wing guy who is Trumpian. You know, these people don't believe in climate change. They don't believe that any of this means anything. They believe that the gigatons that we are putting in the air are somehow good for plants. So even though this article is, uh, it, it kind of, you know, you could say it's pie in the sky, but somebody's got a plan. We can't just sit back and say, let it all go. We're going to just say, hell with it. It's too late. How can we be like that? It's such a, def it's so defeatist. And I get that way sometimes. I mean, I have in my heart of heart sometimes thinking we don't got 40 years. Do we even have 40 years? And then if the blue ocean event happens, if you listen to the scientists of what's going to happen with this blue ocean event and the weather whiplash and the jet stream, it's way worse than what we're seeing this year. And we are seeing a very seriously scary year and it is not over yet. It's August. <laughs> So his conclusion is said, left to their own devices, global government conferences and the financial masters of the universe are unlikely to do what needs to be done to avert climate catastrophe, let alone to put us on the path towards a prosperous and peaceful ecological civilization. I love the way that sounds. Ecological civilization. It just sounds so good. It sounds so utopian. It sounds like it's like right there, but out of grasp but we could make it in our grasp, as he says, locally. We have the power now to start from where we are to make and implement plans for achieving a three ton of carbon dioxide per person per year, sustainable global standard combined with sequestration in soil and biomass to remove the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. He said, we can do this. We can transform by 2040 our neighborhood, town, city, far along the path towards an ecological future. Wow. He's going to have another article and he calls it Climate Truth and it will be discussions on how to make and implement plans to um, build a sustainable local renewable resource economy and how towns and local residents can finance, build and own renewable energy infrastructure and microgrids to come taking advantage of back leverage and tax equity financing using financial tools typically employed just by the wealthy applied for the common good. So he's using what we live in. He's using the paradigm that we live in. And he is he, he's laying out a plan. And I'm sure others have too. I just came across this and I liked it. You know, I, I know that there are going to be detractors and people that say, this is like a pipe dream, it's opium, it's a bunch of shit but I have blood flowing through me and you all have blood throwing, flowing through you. We all love the earth. Why not? Why not just look at this and say, geez, you know, politicians, if you could adopt something like this with your other platform and, and really understand your green energy platform, not just leave it for someone else, to interpret it for you, but really understand this, we we could make a start. Just like the Off Fossil Fuels for a Better Future Act, Tulsi Gabbard's Act. Or we can just say, hey, we're done. We're screwed. Everything's going to hell. I can't do it. And it's okay. I don't put anybody down for feeling that way. Am I an apocalyptimist? I mean, I I I don't know. I just feel like day by day, you got to keep your smiles on. And we have a lot of people like Karen that was with us that has been through living through uh, the, the hell in California of the fires. I mean, what we're doing isn't working. And it's a whole other issue if I start talking about how to change it politically. That's for another day. I've been doing that too. Um, and I talk about these, these things and I get these deniers trying to tell me that uh, I'm all wrong and, and that uh, CO2 is not a problem. And well, it is. 
along with environmental degradation and what we're doing to the oceans and the red tide in Florida, which actually, guys, Tim Canova is supposed to be my next guest. And then I'm on hiatus till September for interviews next week. So we'll let you know what day he will be. I hope it's going to be the 21st or 22nd. I'm really looking forward to hosting Tim on the channel. And uh, we will be live streaming the music from our party. Uh, we have people coming from that I haven't met even from the Doomosphere. No, just people from that, that, that I have encountered uh, on this journey and that cultivated some relationships with. And I think it's great. I, I love it. And uh, I'm excited to bring you all there. So watch for live streams over the weekend of the music. And I don't know if people want to have their face on, but, you know, my big face is. <laughs> So peace, everybody, and thank you for coming and smile today. I know the news is always, always tough to look at on the Environmental Coffee House page, but we got we to gotta have a plan. And I like to believe that this is somewhat of a start. So I'm going to watch and bring him. Maybe I can even get him on. Have a great day, everybody. Peace.